Hey guys, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the potential risk of all of that disinfecting and sanitizing that a lot of us have been doing for the past few months and whether or not this has any impact on our microbiome and overall health. Now, before we get started, I want to express that this information is, of course, for entertainment and educational purposes only, and you should always speak to a doctor and dietitians and healthcare professionals about your unique healthcare needs. Also, by the time that this video goes live or just into the future, there may be some updated research. So I will try to do my best to update the description with that information. Okay, so unless you have been sleeping through 2020 so far, there is a worldwide shortage of sanitizing products available for purchase at just about every store in North America. I already talked about safe protocols for cleaning groceries and your takeout in the age of COVID-19. So if you missed that video, you can check it out right here. But a lot of people have been questioning the potential risks of the hypervigilant state of sanitation that we are all currently living in. Now, before we can get into the nitty gritty of whether or not using bleach is safe and healthy, we need to talk about the concern of these disinfectants on our microbiome. A lot of concern around oversanitation can be traced back to what we know as the hygiene hypothesis, which has basically correlated the rise in industrialization and sanitation practices with the incidence of allergies and autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes, asthma, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, and inflammatory bowel disease. Now, back in the 1980s, an epidemiologist named Dr. Strawn found that the more children in a family or home, the lower the risk of autoimmune diseases and allergies. He proposed that the decreased incidence of infection early on in life, typically passed through unhygienic contact between siblings, could be the cause of developing autoimmune complications later on in life. Now, the term hygiene hypothesis isn't so great. And a lot of scientists have fought to have it changed because personal sanitation practices are one of our first lines of defense against harmful bacteria or viruses. So no one is ever telling you to stop washing your hands in this pandemic or like ever. The concern instead is when these sanitation practices are taken to an extreme or directed at situations that are not actually harmful, significantly limiting children's healthy exposure to the microbes, aka bacteria, in their environment. More recent research has taken the foundation on which the hygiene hypothesis was laid on and developed clear guidelines and recommendations surrounding sanitation and hygiene, which has resulted in what we now know of as targeted hygiene. So evidence now suggests that a combination of strategies should be integrated into young children's lives in order to best protect their microbiomes from complications later on in life. These strategies include vaginal childbirth if possible, breastfeeding if possible, increasing social exposure through things like sports, social interactions and outdoor activities, having pets like cats or dogs in the home, as well as appropriate antibiotic use. Targeted hygiene is where risky activities like touching raw meat or using the washroom should be followed with proper hygienic practices. But at the same time, playing outside in the soil, petting the family dog, and sharing toys with peers should be encouraged. Targeted hygiene allows for the protection against harmful pathogens while also promoting and allowing for the healthy spread of microbes between peers, family members, and the environment. Allowing for the introduction of such microbes is so important for the establishment of a healthy immune system, which for the most part is trained by the age of four. Now, can we improve our microbiome later on in life? There are some strategies that can be utilized in youth and adulthood in order to develop a robust microbiome, including consuming a sufficient amount of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and getting in our exercise. Recent research has linked the Mediterranean diet, which is a diet rich in lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, healthy fats, to significant increases in beneficial microbes in our gut. Therefore, if you're concerned about your microbiome, transitioning to a more balanced and whole food diet may be a good place to start. Other strategies include having pets in the house and living close to agriculture or green space. Bottom line, 
healthy exposure to safe microbes from our environment and each other is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a very good thing. However, these studies are referring to non-pathogenic microbes, not COVID-19. The key is to recognize low-risk situations and high-risk situations and know when to employ enhanced cleaning and sanitation. Washing your hands after grocery shopping in COVID-19 times? Necessary. Purelling your kid's hands the second that they pet the family dog? Not necessary. Okay, so now let's talk about all of those disinfectant wipes, Lysol sprays, bleach, sanitizers, etc., and how they impact our microbiome and health. While the evidence here is very preliminary and done primarily with animals that are fed a diet with these chemicals in it, there is early research to suggest that when or if antimicrobials enter into our body, if not handled properly, it may affect our microbiome. Much of the research has focused on compounds called triclosan and triclocarbon. Now, triclosan is an antimicrobial agent that is added to a lot of household cleaning supplies, as well as soaps, toothpaste, and some cosmetics. The FDA is continuing to monitor this chemical and is aware of studies being done to test its safety for human use. They also did ban the use of both of these chemicals in consumer soaps back in 2016, indicating that they recognized a safety concern with overexposing oneself to them. One study in animals, of course, found that zebrafish, which were fed a diet containing triclosan, experienced an alteration in their gut microbiota after only four days. Another study on humans found an altered gut flora in children who were frequently exposed to household disinfectants. These children were then linked to have a higher body weight by the time that they were three years old when compared to children who were not exposed to heavy home use of disinfectants. Having said that, this is just correlation. And what we don't know is if the families who chose greener methods of cleaning ate healthier, were of higher socioeconomic status, were more likely to be breastfed or had access to the outdoors, attributing to a completely different outcome in their microbiome and ultimately their weight. Another thing to note is that while the study did find a difference in the microbial community composition of the children who were exposed to the non-eco-friendly chemical products, they did not find any changes in the microbial richness or diversity. This essentially means that there were more microbes introduced which were linked to weight gain and or negative health effects, but there was no negative impact on the already existing microbial community. That is the existing type of pre-existing microbes. Bottom line, I'll be honest, the research in this area is not great, period, and we need a lot more of it. But the good news is that of all of the links between hygiene and the microbiome, researchers believe that being too clean in our own homes is one of the weakest and most unsupported notions perpetuated by the hygiene hypothesis. It's believed that if over sanitizing the home contributed to an increase in allergies or autoimmune diseases, it would be a relatively small contribution. This is because microbiological studies have confirmed that regular cleaning habits, while decreasing pathogens and dust temporarily, do not have a sustained effect on microbes in the home. One review article claimed that the idea that we could create sterile homes through excessive cleanliness is implausible. As fast as microbes are removed, they are replaced via dust and air from the outdoor environment and commensal microbes shed from our human body and our pets and contaminated foods brought into the home. Now, what about these cleaning chemicals and our respiratory health, which is obviously a pretty hot topic right now in the COVID-19 age? Well, I did find one study that found that people who worked as cleaners or frequently cleaned their homes with chemicals, particularly aerosols and sprays, had decreasing rates of lung function. Other studies have linked increased asthma rates to cleaning workers and suggest that preventative measures be put in place when using chemical cleaners, especially when it comes to cleaning disinfectant sprays, bleach, and ammonia. Now, are these chemicals safe to use in pregnancy? Probably in moderation, if the conditions are right. 
A large study, which was published in 2018, concluded that chemical use while pregnant resulted in an increased risk of the child in utero developing wheezing and or asthma. But while the media had a total frenzy on this, it's important to note that there was actually no significant relationship found between chemical exposure and lung function tests, and no asthma cases were actually ever confirmed by a medical professional. In response to these misconceptions, the United Kingdom National Health Service issued a comprehensive statement that parents should not be overly concerned with their cleaning regimes so long as they're really following general safety protocols by ensuring rooms are adequately ventilated and precautions are taken to protect oneself from touching and inhaling those fumes. So wearing a mask and wearing gloves. The American Pregnancy Association also ensures that cleaning products, including properly diluted bleach, are safe to use while pregnant, but they too also recommend wearing gloves, ventilating the room, and reading the labels prior to use. Or even better, getting an unpregnant partner to take on the cleaning for a change. Now, what are safe cleaning compounds for combating bad pathogens like COVID-19? So the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, has a comprehensive list of disinfectants or sanitizers that are approved to kill viruses like COVID-19, which are generally grouped as quaternary ammonium compounds, aka quats, like Lysol heavy duty disinfectant, iodine-based sanitizers, acid anionic sanitizers, hydrogen peroxide sanitizers like Clorox, thymol, which is a natural and botanically based disinfectant, or alcohol, aka ethanol, which you can easily buy in 70% ethanol bottles. Choosing eco-friendly alternatives to sanitizers is of course an option, as most popular brands now have a green alternative for a slightly higher price. So I'm gonna leave a link below to some of the EPA approved safe products, but an example that I have personally seen on a lot of shelves is seventh generation products. Note that homemade products like baking soda and vinegar or lemon juice are totally fine for cleaning your home, but are not germicides, and therefore they do not kill germs well enough to actually sanitize. As for those who rely on essential oils as their sanitizer of choice, caution should be taken with this method of cleaning in order to avoid viruses such as COVID-19. While we are starting to see more research surrounding the potential benefits of essential oils for cleaning, it is definitely still lacking. One review found that while some oils have shown antimicrobial properties, their effectiveness does rely on the individual oil's chemical constituents, the quantity of these compounds, as well as the particular properties of the bacteria it's aiming to kill. So basically, some oils may have an effect on some bacteria, but an individual oil will need to be matched with a specific microbe in order for the disinfectant properties to actually take place. These studies were also held in vitro within a lab and have failed to provide any clear mechanism of action, leading the researchers to worry about reproducibility and just the accuracy of their findings. The bottom line is that more research is definitely needed as well as more just actual clinical trials in order to create any clear and scientifically validated recommendations for replacing your household sanitizer with essential oils, especially in COVID-19 times. This is simply because FDA approved sanitizers kill up to 99.9% .9 of germs, which is something that essential oils cannot yet claim. Now, what about soap? Can it be used on my counters and high touch surfaces in place of a chemical disinfectant? So hand washing, as rudimentary as it may seem, protects us from viruses like COVID-19 because it has the potential to inactivate the virus before effectively washing it down the sink, if the hand washing is done properly and for 20 seconds. In the same way that soap attaches to the oil and dirt on our hands to wash the debris down the sink, so too does it attach the molecules that are responsible for infecting us with coronavirus. Because of this, the most effective, easy, and sensible way to break the chain of infection is with proper and regular hand washing. This can be done with any regular soap as there's actually no additional benefit to using an antibacterial soap if proper hand washing procedures are actually followed. 
Now I have to say an antibacterial sanitizer or disinfectant is still the number one recommendation for cleaning high traffic surfaces in your home because they can kill 99.9% .9 of germs in seconds. But if cleaning supplies are short in your area, soapy water and some elbow grease can still do the trick. Following the same logic as with proper hand washing, surfaces can be scrubbed with soapy water for at least 20 seconds and then thoroughly rinsed off in order to ward off germs and viruses. So bottom line, how can we safely clean in a pandemic? We know that being exposed to an array of microbes is important, but we also know that not protecting ourselves from harmful pathogens like COVID-19 can be detrimental to our health. I'm sure this point will be driven home due to the current situation, but the belief that children must be exposed to harmful microbes in order to build a robust immune system is simply not true. This has never actually been the case. Targeted hygiene is a risk assessment directed at sorting out the high risk situations where the pathogenic transmission is more likely from low risk situations where microbes are not harmful and or there is not a high risk of exposure. So to start, there are key times when practicing hygiene in order to break the chain of infection is really important. These high risk times include during food handling, while eating with hands, after using the washroom, after coughing or sneezing into your hands or nose blowing, after handling soiled or dirty linen, after handling or disposing of garbage, caring for animals, and caring for an infected family member who is vomiting, coughing, and or having diarrhea. So should you stress about your temporary uptick in hypervigilant cleaning rituals? I mean, not necessarily, as long as you're taking the precautions to reduce your risk of excess chemical exposure, like ventilating the space really well or wearing a mask and gloves. Also, I do suggest taking the time to recognize which situations are high risk and which are not. I mean, perhaps the excessive cleaning is not necessarily called for if there hasn't been exposure to a potentially risky situation outside or inside the home. So on that note, that is all for today, folks. As always, if you like this video, please give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below if you have any microbiome related questions. I love talking about the microbiome. Subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.